Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, so like Katya said, I'm going to talk about interactive streaming and the future of esports. Uh, first, I'll just start with a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Christopher Hamilton. I've been in the industry for about 12 years. I'm currently based in Helsinki, Finland, uh, but I got my start in St. Petersburg, Russia uh, at Navasoft, uh, where I was invited to translate games from Russian into English and make very sort of adaptive translations to fit the uh, Western markets. Uh, from there, I started translating, not translating, but managing the localization process into 12 other languages. Uh, started going to conferences, got involved in partner relations, really understood how the industry began to work, um, did a lot of competitor analysis, and sort of uh, worked on the publishing side for Navisoft. Uh, from there, I moved on to Play Academy, where I was managing development teams in Poland and Ukraine, making casual games for PC. Uh, did some consulting for GameHouse, helping them sign some Russian developers for their mobile publishing program. Eventually moved on to Rovio, where I moved to Helsinki. Uh, there I was the producer on Plunder Pirates, which was an externally uh, developed game in the UK. And I worked on Angry Birds Epic for about two and a half years in the live ops phase, uh, basically games as a service. Uh, from there I moved to the back-end team and I helped uh, develop better live ops tools to manage uh, basically the whole Rovio portfolio. And then recently I left to work uh, for an independent studio in Helsinki called Heavyweight Rex that is making a collectible card game. Uh, my responsibilities basically covered a full gambit from localization, QA, production, live ops management, uh, and developer-publisher relations. Um, I also feel, strong, feel very strongly about giving back to the community. Uh, so when I moved to Finland, I got involved in IGDA Finland and was eventually elected to their board. I got involved with the Finnish Game Jam, which organizes game jams all across Finland and also organizes exchange programs to exchange jamming cultures uh, with different countries around the world. Uh, I was elected to the global board of the IGDA a couple years ago, and I'm still serving a three-year term with them. Uh, and I'm involved in a UNEP uh, project called Playing for the Planet that is urging gaming companies to become carbon neutral and to put some environmental nudges in their games. Uh, these are things I do kind of above and beyond work. If anybody's interested in any of these initiatives, feel free to talk to me afterwards. So, recently among all my hats, <laughs> I've been helping this company, Genvid, think through their developer-facing outreach and what it takes to enable viewers to reach out, touch, feel, and interact their games as viewers. There's a lot to unpack here, and I just want to say that I'm not selling anything. I just want to maybe plant some seeds in your head uh, about how maybe some of these technologies could apply to your game or other games or games that you're seeing, uh, because this is kind of a shift in thinking. Um, so basically, I just want to share some of the lessons that Genvid, as an early pioneer in this part of the industry, uh, have learned through our experience in partnering with developers and various platforms. Genvid is Latin for birth and viewing, which reflects the company's mission of creating a new era in interactive streaming. Uh, it is a well-funded company backed by several prestigious VCs and was founded four years ago by some Square Enix veterans. Uh, now we have offices uh, all over the world with headquarters in New York, development studio in Montreal, live ops team in LA, uh, offices in Tokyo, and a new one that we just opened in Berlin, and I'm sort of the lone wolf in, in Helsinki. Uh, this is our wonderful team of nerds. These are highly talented folks, uh, a lot of fun to work with, that have all worked at companies like Blizzard, Riot, Square Enix, Ubisoft, and a lot of them have experience in esports. Um, has anybody heard of Genvid? Okay, there are a couple of you. Um, hundreds of millions of people are watching games, and developers here have an opportunity in what is a paradigm shift from players to viewers. Esports is dominated by viewers. Genvid creates frameworks and tools to enhance the viewing experience. We as developers need to think about things more from a viewer perspective. Uh, this is sort of a challenge for developers because as developers, we don't think of viewers as our consumers. Uh, we only focus on players. Games and traditional media are really at a point of convergence. Uh, games are becoming more like media, and media is becoming more like games. In terms of business model, Technology and content, um, games are really in the hardest space. They have the most fickle users, both in terms of spending time and their money. Traditional media understands that games have a huge advantage over them in terms of engagement. Games are at an interesting place to adopt a number of best practices from traditional media, with a growing audience watching games on Twitch and YouTube. So they're at an interesting point right now to really address viewership in games. 
So the current viewer offering really isn't viewer friendly, and I'd like to juxtapose now uh, how things evolved over time uh, with the world of real sports. Uh, so we've charted here the audience experience size and monetization from left to right. Uh, first, we have the players, and we're not making a whole lot of money selling them more footballs or sporting equipment or anything. Uh, next, we have participants. Uh, these are people that are spending extra time, extra money to go to a stadium for a more immersive experience. They want to have a closer connection to what they're watching. And then all the way on the right, we have the viewers watching on TV at home. This is where the big money is. This is broadcast rights, sponsorships. Each component here in sports has led to the other. If you do not have a good player experience, you get low adoption, and then you can't really build a participant experience. Uh, you can't get enough stakeholders, and then you cannot find the ad deals and the sponsorships. Uh, so really, there's a continuum that goes across all three of these phases in sports. So let's compare this now to the game space. For the most part, again, games are about the player and only the player. From a developer's perspective, they're only monetizing players through play, uh, ads or IAPs. It doesn't become content for other people until a game gets really big, and then you have some players that start to watch other players on Twitch, mostly looking for best practices. Um, and this is certainly the attitude at any gaming company that I've worked at. Uh, there was always a push to build a community. There was a push to be streaming on YouTube or on Twitch, but the community was always focused on the player experience, um, leaving viewers just ignored. Uh, good that people are watching, but we're not really going to do anything special for them. Um, so we have a gap here, uh, which I'll get to later, but the participant sort of in-stadium experience uh, really isn't there yet. Uh, we're seeing people watch games on Twitch and YouTube, but uh, it's not really um, a huge in-stadium experience. It's really just for best practices. So you don't have the continuum here that you have with real sports. So why is that? And this is going back to what I was saying before about developers not really caring about the viewer. Games were not created for spectating. The spectator mode in the game is really just um, kind of maybe there when the game ships. Uh, no real added features. You don't have a god mode. You can't walk around anywhere to really watch the game from different angles. Um, and the devs really don't want you watching the game. They want you playing it. Uh, again, they feel that monetization is focused on players. So if you're watching, it's probably because you're not good at the game, and therefore, as developers, we're incentivized to make a better matchmaking system so that we can get you in and playing the game as a player. And this image here kind of goes into what I was saying before. If you're watching eSports uh, on Twitch, and you're only getting the player perspective, you really don't really understand what's going on in the game. Um, it's kind of unfair because we're holding eSports to a standard of real sports, but in real sports, the spectator experience has evolved uh, with the game and the advent of new technologies like radio and television. So the spectator experience in baseball evolved over 80 years, uh, and we're not talking about what we need to do to get uh, from a gaming experience to an eSports experience kind of overnight. And it's important to note this because these are all spectator-driven experiences, spectator-driven businesses. So GenVid started to think about things from the spectator's perspective, uh, started building spectator-centric value, and started working with developers that are uniquely capable of doing this. So we as developers need to be bridging this gap, and this is sort of an ongoing debate. Do we need more players? Or we need to make things more mainstream by getting people like my mom, who's never really played video games, able to watch and understand and appreciate an Overwatch stream. Um, just like she loves basketball. She'll channel surf. She's not a huge basketball fan, but when she comes across basketball on the TV, she'll stop and she'll watch it. She'll get into it. To a certain extent, this is true for me. Um, I used to play console games as a kid, but I don't really have time anymore. Uh, most of the games I play are casual, uh, and I think this is part of a bigger trend. Games just take time. If you're playing a competitive game, it takes a lot of time to get good at that game. Uh, it's the kind of thing that I can sort of jump in and enjoy on a stream, um, maybe passively or some active viewing, um, but it's not something that I can truly invest a lot of time in. So there is an audience of people out there that want to watch these games that really don't have a good access to it. So I think as developers, we need to think about interactivity and remember that other sports and large spectacles evolved with tech from radio to television. Uh, so it all sort of started with live commentary, showing the game, 
digital overlays that provide more information, um, some augmented reality type things. I mean, when I'm watching football at home, uh, I usually pull up a stream or some information on my iPad so I can follow live scores from other matches and have stats about the last series of sets of things that happened in the game. I believe we as developers do ourselves a disservice if we don't think about these broadcast medium best practices and that they can't make a difference in our games. Now, if we do this, we're no longer focused on just players. We have a whole spectrum of people from players to interactive viewers um, to spectators. And these are more people that we can monetize, but less people in the audience that are really interested in the core experience of playing the game. So one thing Jen did vid is we partnered with tournament organizers like Faceit, Starladder, uh, using Twitch as our platform partner and Stat Helix as our statistic partner to run the premium pass for the last three Counter-Strike majors. Uh, has anyone here been a customer of the Premium Pass or followed any of the competitive events that are happening on Counter-Strike? Okay. Um, here's another example. Uh, have anybody heard of Omen of Sorrow? It was a game developed by A1, which is a small team in Chile. They've done some amazing things. Uh, they were one of epic grant winters. Uh, and they've just um, realized that fighting games are sort of difficult to follow. Um, yeah, you've probably played Street Fighter, but if you've played it, you kind of get the idea of what the genre is about. Um, but there's so much that we don't understand if you're not really playing that specific game. Uh, so we worked with A1 to show hitboxes in real time, toggle on and off a HUD, uh, and see live player input of actually what controls players were using. Um, and what this means is like if I'm a new viewer to the game and I want to really understand what's going on, all of this information is super helpful. It really helps me get into the game. And then even if I have a seasoned player or I've played a similar game, I might see something in this game that gets me attracted to actually play the game myself. So it becomes sort of an onboarding mechanism. Um, they've even added this really cool win-loss probability feature that they call odds. Um, and that if you're new to the... Um, new to the game or new to the genre, that whole swing of going back and forth that really shows you what key things happen that um, sway the game. Um, so uh, as developers, again, we need to think more about the viewer experience and giving them the data that viewer wants. Um, we can give them cameras and let the market decide. It's not that difficult to do. Uh, for eSports, often we're talking about viewing outside of the engine uh, because it provides the least friction. It's great that Valve made a free version of the game and I can go watch GoTV, um, but I need to have a high-end computer with great specs and a good internet connection to do that. Um, so streaming just offers less uh, friction for the viewers. Uh, looking at the middle bit here, uh, again, as viewers, we can guide the viewers as if um, there are new maps or there are some things that are happening in this. This is not information that would go to the player, but again, it helps the viewers kind of understand what's going on in the game. Uh, and on the right slide, and I think this is important, um, I don't think you can make any game into an esports game, but you can create interactive experiences where players can uh, have some sort of impact on the game, whether it's helping a player or hurting the player, whether it's creating some sort of uh, home and away type feeling uh, with different things that are going on in the game. Uh, all of these things, when we think about these experiences, need to be on a genre by genre basis. Uh, n it's not necessarily the same game uh, regarding the real-world counterparts. So if we're talking about a fighting game, um, it's not necessarily like watching a boxing match or an MMA match, because a fighting game is really fast and tactical. A boxing match is sort of long, drawn out, and more strategic. Uh, so think of it more as in like tennis or badminton, uh, where replays are really important, uh, and everything is fast-paced uh, fast and tactical focused. Um, MOBAs, action, FPSs are more in line with like American football. Uh, or soccer, it's more team-oriented. There are trick plays and coordinated moves. Um, CCGs, um, we have real-life examples of this in poker. Uh, Real-time statistics are important, uh, as well as deck information. Twitch has done amazing things with Innkeeper, if anybody's experienced that. And then uh, MMOs, I like to think of more like golf. Um, it can be slow. There's a long narrative kind of thing that can happen there. You've got um, one player that's going on the course that he was on a couple of years ago, uh, really struggled with a particular hole, um, and the announcer can kind of talk about what happened then, maybe so some replays from the past. Same thing with, a, with an MMO. You've got these two teams, these two guilds. They had a showdown a couple of years ago. Let's see how they're going to do this year, and let's see what they did last year. Um, shifting gears a bit to talk about the levels of, of interactive streaming. Um, there are three levels of different engagement that, that we can give. 
um, that all will impact game design and monetization. Uh, so informational, again, is just giving players information. If you're watching an FPS, you might be able to click on something, pull up charts, you might be able to pull up a map and see where all the players are. Uh, these are things that high-level players already know, but not necessarily new viewers. Uh, how can we monetize this? Well, it's pretty easy just by giving it away for free. Uh, you're improving player onboarding by getting players excited into the game. Um, you're, you can get it sponsored if the game is big enough. You can probably do geo-targeted ads. Um, and if you're big enough, uh, really big, you can put it behind a paywall. Um, the information is already in the game, so this is the easy thing to do from a design perspective. It's more about identifying the data that you want to expose to your viewers and then putting it in a way that feels native to your game. The next tier is customizable, and basically this is the idea that you have different interest groups watching your game and giving each of them a native experience. What does this mean? This could be something like just putting different cameras out and letting people select from different cameras, but it could also be something like uh, different languages. So in eSports, we're seeing more segmentation. There could be an English channel, maybe a Korean channel. This again creates that home and away effect. Um, and particularly with shoutcasters, it gets them talking about specific teams. Uh, literally, it's just understanding what's going on from the localization perspective. Um, but this is just website over video, so splitting this up into different packages isn't all that difficult to do. Monetization is pretty much the same thing because, again, you're tracking engagement. Uh, it's a little more lift when it comes to design because you have to figure out of your viewers which one wants which experience, what languages do they want, what sort of maps do they want, what sort of customization do they want. Um, and then if you're doing like a battle royale, do you really want to give them 100 different player views? Probably not. So again, this might be something that a genre by genre you need to look at. And then last but not least, and this is often what people think of first, but I'm addressing it last, is influence. This is where viewers can actually dictate some of the outcome based on their input. Uh, it's something like cheering, and players can actually hear you cheer in their headsets. Um, it's something like you can put, um, you can buy, say, some sort of loot crate, and you can ship it to somewhere in the game. And this begins to create that sort of Hunger Games effect that a lot of people like. Uh, there are a number of games where there are loot boxes that will appear in the games, and everybody in the community can start voting for what's going to appear in that loot box. Again, in terms of monetization, I think it's pretty clear. Now you can actually sell things to viewers. Uh, but this is really the most difficult thing to do from a design perspective, because now your viewer is an element in your game. Um, but there are a lot of things in the game that are RNG-based or that are scripted that we can now allow players to have input. Uh, so it's not so much having them determine the outcome of the game, but having a whole bunch of community vote on a certain number of outcomes that would have been chosen by something that's RNG-based anyways. So the more you go down that influencer spectrum, the more you have a co-creation of a new game experience where there's the player and the audience in a kind of interplaying with one another. And I have a couple examples now that I can quickly run through. Uh, that show how some developers are experimenting in this space. Um, and I'm gonna, running out of time, so I'm going to skip to this one, um, which is Project Eleusis. It's sort of an interactive loss type game. Uh, this was done by one developer that had an experiment with a robust AI. Uh, they have a number of NPC castaways on an island that are basically all sort of attacking one another, or they all have a number of different things like uh, goals of eating and sleeping and attacking to determine the last man standing. And I like to refer to this as an online ant farm because viewers can sort of sit back and just watch it happen, um, or they can drop in various weapons or food or things to help all the different players. So uh, key takeaways in conclusion, eSports is the first opportunity for developers to see that there is a viewing audience for games. Uh, the more competitive it is, the more a traditional eSport it can be, uh, but there are lots of opportunities uh, to start building a viewer experience for all types of games. Uh, it's still very early. We're still trying to figure out what the best balance is. Um, and there are a lot of experiences that can be had across the entire player-viewer spectrum. So it's exciting days, and I'm looking forward to see what developers are coming up with, and I hope maybe this has given you some food for thought. Um, and I look forward to um, seeing game designs that address your audience. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I can show some demos afterwards. Thank you.